Welcome, Thanks. everyone. It's great to see you. Happy New Year. Can you believe it? It's another new year. We're almost um, two years into our town halls. April will be two years. We've been doing them monthly since then. We've done 19 or 20 of these. Um, as, as Judy said, it's a it's a snowy or rainy day, depending on where you live. So we're really happy to have you here. And um, we have a really interesting program for you today. And, and I want to welcome you all. I'm going to pass the baton to uh, Susan Edgman Levitan, who's going to tell you about our speakers for today. And we hope you really enjoy this program and we'll give you food, food for thought. Great to Thank see you. you all. Thank you, Dr. Levine. It is great to see you all. Um, so as we get started, um, my name is Susan Edgman Levitan, and I'm the Executive Director of the Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation at Mass General, and I'm going to be the moderator today. So I want to share a few of our housekeeping rules. So first of all, everyone on the call except for the speakers is muted to eliminate any background noise or distractions that might make it difficult to hear our speakers. To view the speaker on your full screen, go up to the gallery view in the upper right corner of your screen, and um, or actually you, can, you go up to the upper right corner and you either click on speaker view or gallery view. The gallery view lets you see everybody participating on the call today. If your picture becomes jumpy or out of sync, click stop video in the lower left corner. That will take you off screen and that also will help speed up your connection. We, we know that many of you have questions. And so if you want to ask a question, please enter it in the chat feature, which is right in the middle of the bottom ribbon across your screen. Um, I know you've heard this many times, but please do not share or ask about any personal medical questions because everything you write in the chat can be seen by everyone. And we also ask that you not show any medical issues or questions. On, you know, we, we, we don't want to see your rash today. Um, so because everyone will see your rash. So if you do have a medical question, please reach out to your doctor directly. So with that, I am going to introduce our speakers today. We are first going to hear from Dr. Jordi Marino, who is the Marie Curie Fellow in the Diabetes Unit and the Center for Genomics Medicine at Mass General, and he's also an instructor in medicine. And then we'll be hearing from Dr. Deborah Lee, who is a geriatrician in our geriatric medicine program, and she's also a practice, and she's also the senior core educator for geriatric resident education in the Mass General Department of Medicine. One quick thing I want to mention is that the topic today it, that we'll be hearing about from Dr. Marino is a very interesting study about the role that diet can play in potentially helping to reduce your risk or the severity of COVID. But Dr. Marino is not a nutritionist. And we know that some of you have submitted questions that are very specific questions about diet, types of food, et cetera. But those aren't the kinds of things that he can really talk about for the most part today. So if you do have questions about things like that, please go ahead and enter them. If we can answer them, we will, but if it seems like this is a topic of interest, we'll, we'll um, do a different town hall later where we'll have um, a nutritionist or other people that, that have that kind of expertise. So with that, I wanna welcome Dr. Marino and let's get going. Dr. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for the invitation to present at this town hall meeting. I'm really excited about, about the opportunity to share our study on the beneficial role of healthy plant-based diets on the risk and severity of COVID-19. So before we start, let me acknowledge my disclosures. I've been involved in a study that used the mobile phone application that I will be explaining you today about. So this is something that I like to 
disclose in front. So to give you some historical context about the role of food in a pandemic, let me start by this slide showing that the flu of 1918 infected about one third of the world's population and killed between one to 5% of the population according to different sources. Because governments were concerned about negative press about the impact of the pandemic, there were only a few public records about the real impact of the pandemic and what people should do to stay healthy and avoid influence. The only real advice came from the Surgeon General of the US Army who highlighted 12 rules to avoid influence. We are now somehow familiar with these recommendations that were targeted to reduce uh, social contact and promote isolation by avoiding crowded spaces and by covering your, your nose or use ventilation for closer spaces. If you can see these 12 rules, rule number seven explicitly mentioned that food will win the war if you give it a chance. So this means that taking care of the food that someone will, would eat during the pandemic would help to diminish the chances of getting influenza. So many cities like Boston or New York City began to implement these recommendations. And uh, for example, physical plants in Boston and New, and New York City were converted to kitchens where cooking could be done to support sick families. So these strategies are considered a key public health action that help reduce the burden of the pandemic in cities like Boston or New York City. So the world has changed a lot over the last 100 years, but concerns about poor nutrition are still important. American diet is far from optimal. Ultra processed foods have become widely available and as consequence, less than 15% of Americans consume recommended intakes for fruits and vegetables, legumes, or whole grains. A recent study showed that processed foods account for about 70% of total caloric intake in kids, suggesting that this population is likely to fail minimum dietary recommendations for essential nutrients, such as vitamins, minerals, or certain amino acids. So further, large disparities in nutrition exist. While healthy foods are less accessible and affordable to many people, millions of dollars are spent to promote the consumption of less healthy food choices. Our modern food environment impedes rather than promotes a health, healthy eating. So also, what we learned over the last couple of years is that COVID does not strike at random. Poor nutrition has been a common future among groups of people disproportionately affected by the disease, and there has been increasing efforts to try to understand the links between metabolic health and COVID risk and severity. So in our study, we asked the simple question whether what you eat contribute to the risk and progression of COVID. So to address this question, we use data from the smartphone-based COVID-19 symptom study. This cell phone application was launched in the UK and the US on March 2020 with the aim to better understand and characterize the disease symptomatology and identify risk factors for COVID. The study is led by our own Professor Andreu Chan and Tim Spector from the King College in London and includes now data for more than, for more than uh, 5.7 million participants. So if you are interested in downloading this application and contribute to our study, you are welcome to do so because the app is still in life and people are currently reporting their symptoms and all the information related to, to COVID risk and severity. So this slide briefly illustrates the mobile phone application and the type of questions that we are asking in our study. So when participants download the app, they could sign a digital informed concern. In this initial interaction, people provide clinical and demographic information, including, for example, their age, the race, the zip code, medical history, or the use of medications. So they also provide information on the healthcare worker status or any symptoms related to COVID. 
So when this baseline information is collected, daily reminders query for updates on symptoms, healthcare visits, treatments, or COVID uh, testing results. So one of the strengths of this approach is that the survey is easy, adaptable to different platforms. So for, so for example, we could, in a matter of weeks or days, we could launch new surveys, ask new questions for things that are uh, relevant to COVID today. So for example, in one of the latest surveys, we are asking participants to provide information about the vaccination status to investigate the potential effect of vaccines on the new Omicron variant or to investigate how vaccines could be related to the long COVID. So in one of these surveys that we are constantly launching and asking to participants to complete, we ask participants to provide information about their diet and lifestyle before the pandemic to understand the role of diet and lifestyle and the risk and progression of, of COVID-19. So this diet survey was launched in August, September 2020, and specifically asked participants to provide information about their diet and lifestyle during the pre-pandemic uh, period, which, which means February 2020. So in this diet survey, we use what we call a food frequency questionnaire. So this is a kind of questionnaire that asks uh, the, for, the, for the frequency of the consumption of, of different food items. Because this is a mobile phone application, we cannot, we cannot ask for participants to provide a lot of information. So we rather use a very short version of a food frequency questionnaire that includes information of essential uh, dietary variables that can help us to identify how likely are people to eat better or, or not. So, so we use this short food frequency questionnaire item that includes 27 items and participants were asked how frequent they consume these 27 items. So with these 27 items, what we did is to calculate a metric that it's called a healthy plant-based diet index, which emphasize the consumption of foods such as fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and this dietary index has been associated with the development of, of, of other diseases like type 2 diabetes, cancer, or cardiovascular disease. So to generate this healthy plant-based diet index, uh, the 27 food items in the food frequency questionnaire were combined in, into 14 food groups, and these 14 food groups were ranked into quintiles of the distribution. And there are two types of, 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 of foods, the green ones and the red ones. The green ones, which are the healthiest, the highest consumption of these different food groups gives you a score of five, and then it decreases until a score of one with the less amount of consumption of these foods. And then the scores are inverse for the, the, the red foods in which highest consumption of these foods gives you a score of one and lowest consumption of these foods gives you a score of five. So at the end, with these 14 uh, food items, what we can do is to generate a continuous variable of adherence to a healthy plant-based diet. And this uh, score can range from 14 to 70. And 70 means higher adher adherence to the healthy plant-based diet and 14 lower adherence to this diet. So what we were interested in is in investigate the potential role of diet on the risk of COVID and the severity of COVID. So for the risk of COVID, we use something that it's called a symptom-based algorithm, which means that based on the symptoms that people reported during the follow-up of our study, we were able to, ca to categorize them as having COVID or not having COVID. We validated this symptom-based algorithm in a previous paper, and we know that this is a good way to identify COVID cases. And one of the rationality to use this algorithm to quantify or to categorize COVID risk is because at the very beginning of the pandemic, PCR tests were not widely available, and people could not know whether they have COVID or not. So based on the symptoms that they report during the follow-up, we were able to generate a metric that can categorize the risk, uh, can categorize individuals based on cases and controls. So we were also interested in COVID severity. And in our study, COVID severity was ascertained by the need for a hospital visit 
which require either non-invasive breathing support, invasive breathing support, or the administration of antibiotics combined with oxygen support. And then in one of the, our secondary outcomes, instead of using the symptom-based algorithm to define COVID case and control, we use the PCR positive test. So this is the statistical approach that we took in our study. So we were interested in investigating the association between diet quality and COVID risk and COVID severity. This is a very uh, simple interpretation of the potential confounders that can be in this association. So we identified two types of confounders, what we call demographic confounders, things like age, country of residence, sex, ethnicity, population density can be associated with both, can be associated with diet quality and also with the COVID risk and severity, but also these demographic confounders are related to lifestyle or health related confounders. Seeing things such as BMI, smoking or physical activity can impact on your risk of COVID and also have a bidirectional association with diet quality. So people with higher BMI tend to eat a, a lower diet quality, while people with low BMI tend to eat a higher diet quality. So there is this bidirectional association between our exposure of interest and these kind of confounders. So in our models, we took into account this potential set of confounders and adjusted for, 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 for this. So this is the flow diagram of, of our study. So about 650,000 participants completed the diet and lifestyle survey that we launched in uh, August, uh, September, 2020. Among these participants, we had to exclude people who already had COVID when completed the survey or who had symptoms related to COVID or people that were younger than 18 years old. So after all these exclusions, we had about 600,000 participants with diet data and, and, and outcome information. And among, and among them, about 32,000 were categorized as COVID positive cases, while 560,000 were non-COVID cases. So our population, it's a likely healthy population, middle age healthy population. The median age of our study was 56 years, BMI in the 25th. So 90% of the participants are from the UK, majority of them are white, we have a 70% female, female representation. And when we look where these people live based on the zip code, the majority of people live in less the private regions. So this is the distribution of the diet quality score. The way to interpret this plot is that in the x-axis, so meaning below, we have the score, uh, the numbers meaning mean the, the number of items that you had in, 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 in the diet quality score. And then the y-axis means the number of participants that uh, are in each score. So what we did with our score, it's to split it in four similar parts, uh, what, what, what we co which we call quartile one, quartile two and quartile three and quartile four. So individuals in the quartile one, which include about 150,000 participants, their diet quality range from 20 to 48. Then the two quartiles in the middle, their diet quality range from 49 to 53. And then individuals with a higher diet quality, their, uh, their diet quality range from 54 to 68. So that's important because all the comparisons that I will talking now about are comparing the red participants with the blue participants. So this slide summarizes our findings. So when we compare individuals with the high diet quality with those with the low diet quality, what we show is that, that, is that high diet quality was associated with lower risk of COVID. And the multivariable adjusted model suggests that the hazard ratio was 0.90. 91, meaning, meaning that high diet quality compared with low diet quality is associated with a 9% lower, lower risk of getting COVID, even after accounting for all these potential confounders. When we use not the predicted COVID outcome, but the COVID that was based on the self-report of a PCR positive test, this has a ratio went from 0.91 to 0.80, 
meaning that high diet quality compared with low diet quality was associated with lower 20% risk of uh, getting the infection. What it was more relevant was the effect of diet quality on the severity of COVID on the hospitalization. So here, compared with individuals at low diet quality, high diet quality was associated with lower risk of severe COVID with an adjusted hazard ratio of 0 0.59, meaning that this is a 41% lower risk of getting severe COVID when people follow a healthy diet quality compared with the low diet quality. So then, because there is this uh, overlap between diet quality and socioeconomic deprivation, what we did was to stratify our analysis based on where people live. So what we found here was that when we look at the association between diet quality and the risk of COVID in people living in areas with higher deprivation, the number of individuals per 10,000 person month who developed COVID was 14.8. Well, this number went down to 22.5 when we look at individuals who live in regions with low socioeconomic deprivation. What this suggests is that there is a synergy between diet quality and socioeconomic deprivation on the risk of COVID. And what it also suggests is that at least a third of the COVID cases in the population would have prevented if one of these two exposures were not present. If you remove from the equation diet quality, poor diet quality, or if you remove from the equation higher deprivation indexes, a third of the COVID cases would have prevented. So we conducted several sensitive analyses to investigate the robustness of our findings. Uh, one of the first sensitive analyses was to look at the association between diet quality and COVID risk according to different levels of community transmission. So I'm sure that by that time you all have heard about the RT, the transmission rate of the virus, meaning that if the RT is high, more people get infected because one single person can, can be more contagious. So what we, what we did in our analysis is to restrict the COVID cases that happened during the weeks of high community transmission. And what we found was that individuals with low diet quality, the incident rate per 10,000 persons month was about 148. And this went down to 93 for individuals with high diet quality. So the difference is quite high. And then the multivariable hazard ratio for this uh, difference of the incident rate, it's 0 0.84, meaning that in periods of high community transmission, a high diet quality compared with a low diet quality is associated with a lower 16% risk of getting COVID. The same type of, type of pattern holds when we restricted our analysis to times where the community transmission was low, but the results are slightly attenuated. So one of the additional sensitive analysis that we conducted was to account for the effect of mass wearing. So mass wearing is probably one of the main factors driving COVID infection. So we conducted a sensitive analysis and adjust our models for mask wearing. And what we show was that the main findings hold and here the hazard ratio or, or the estimate effect size was 12% lower when comparing individuals with high diet quality with those with low diet quality. So this study was relevant because for the first time reported the beneficial association of diet quality with COVID risk and severity. So our findings expand previous research previous basic research on the role of nutrients on inflammation and immune system function, but, that, but uh, this has never been done in a large scale population and it's never been done outside from the laboratory. So our study, it's one of the first studies providing initial evidence that a healthy plant-based diet can be associated with lower risk of uh, COVID and the severity of the disease. I think that it's relevant from our study that we were able to quantify this synergic effect between diet and deprivation in the risk of COVID, suggesting that both factors are really important. And what the clinical or public health implication of our study is that uh, some efforts to address disparities in COVID should consider access to healthy foods, especially in the context of higher social deprivation. There are some limitations from this study. Those are limitations related to the self-report 
information that we receive it. So there is no way that we can verify that the information provided is accurate. And this can lead to spurious associations on the association between diet and, and COVID risk and severity. There is something that we call residual confounding, meaning that even that we try to account for different confounding factors, it's impossible in an observational study to uh, account for all of them. So it may be so it's possible that our results might be biased by residual confounding. And then one of the important limitations of this work is that people who reported their diet, their COVID symptoms, their positive test, the hospitalization are people who are likely uh, motivated by health uh, aspects and they take uh, other actions in addition to eating a healthy diet. So what it might happen is that our results might not be generalability to other populations or, or other subgroups of the population. So the study has been published in a journal that it's called GAT. Uh, it's free, everyone can read it. Uh, if you type in Google diet quality and COVID risk GAT, you will, you will find it and, and, and it's open. So all the details of the study are, are, are presented there. And yeah, just to finalize, I'd like to thank uh, the help of, this, of all these people who contributed the study. It's been a huge task to launch a mobile phone application and have more than 4 million people uh, providing information on the risk factors for COVID and the vaccines and everything. So I especially like to thank Professor Andrew Chan for his help and his uh, leadership on, on this study. And with all of this, I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take any questions after the Q&A. Thanks. I think we're going to move to Dr. Lee and we'll answer questions when Dr. Lee is finished. Thank you, Dr. Marino. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, Dr. Marino, thank you so much for a very thought provoking um, topic as you think about how we live with COVID going forward. Um, I'm also here to share a little bit of an update about COVID in general from a kind of um, kind of more bird's eye view. So um, in the US, we have a higher number of confirmed COVID cases today compared to any time before. Um, in the US nationally, we have about 754,000 new cases being diagnosed per day. About 15,000 of those are in Massachusetts. I know this is a super busy slide. I just want to draw your attention on these purple boxes here, about 15,000 new cases a day in Massachusetts, meaning almost anywhere from 15 to 20% of us are positive um, in Massachusetts right now. Um, the number of total daily cases have really um, risen um, and surpassed the peak from last year's spring because of many factors, just more cases, but also because we have you know, highly contagious um, variants like Omicron and we have more testing around than we did say a year ago. Um, currently, there are about 3,200 patients in Massachusetts who are requiring a hospital level of stay for their COVID. And um, somewhere, almost 600 of them are within our Massachusetts Brigham Hospital system. There's a notable change compared to months past, which is that many of our patients um, with COVID in the hospital are here with COVID, not because of COVID necessarily. So many of them might be here with something else, um, but they happen to be found to have COVID as well. Um, and the good news is that when we look at our wastewater data in Massachusetts, which can be um, a predictor of how much virus we're shedding and so a predictor of how much cases we're going to be seeing, we have some, um, you know, cautionary optimism that maybe we're at the peak right now and things will start to get better. This is the viral shed in the wastewater. And another silver lining here is that we really do think vaccination is protective. So if you look at this last column right here, see, you see the percent of um, people who are fully vaccinated, meaning they got their first um, you know, one or two doses, and then they got boosted. 5% um, of COVID cases in Massachusetts are among the fully vaccinated. Um, 
may not even 0.1% of the hospitalizations for COVID are among the vaccinated and 0.02% of deaths due to COVID are among the vaccinated versus non-vaccinated. So I'm getting on my not so, um, uh, not so discreet soapbox about the importance of vaccinating still. Um, to put that in another perspective, um, this is data pulled from after Delta became the most common variant among us. Um, if you're fully vaccinated, five times more protection or five times reduced risk of infection, more than, oops, sorry, more than 10 times um, the risk of uh, less risk, less uh, chance of being hospitalized and more than 10 times less chance of dying from COVID. So again, it would be false to say there are no breakthrough cases if you've been fully vaccinated, but we have much stronger data to convince us that you are protected from hospitalizations and deaths, which are actually the things that we really care about. Um, so let's move on to talk about vaccinations. If you have been a little bit on the fence about getting fully um, vaccinated and or boosted, please know they're still available. Um, the, um, if you get primary care with us or within the MGH and Brigham system, we have our own um, uh, clinics for our patients, but you can also go to mass.gov on this website here to find um, these vaccinations at local pharmacies and other public venues. Um, and right now, there's no official recommendation for a fourth um, shot or fourth booster, but, um, but please be on the lookout. That's being actively researched right now. I also want to mention that more towns and cities are requiring proof of vaccination in many public and private uh, spaces. And while your doctor might have um, the records from all the places you got the vaccines, we can't give out the formal cards that Massachusetts is now promoting. To do that, you can go to this website, myvaxrecords.mass.gov, and then you can download, print, and even get a digital copy of your full vaccination record. Um, and that could be kind of your passport to get around these public places that are um, uh, requesting proof now. Oh, sorry, and just click to the next one here. Oh, sorry about that. In terms of testing. Um, we know that there is a, a, a shortage right now of um, tests still. Um, I think there's more recognition at the governmental level that this is a need and they're working on it on increasing access. Home tests can be really useful because you can do it at home. You don't need to be outside where there are other possibly COVID positive people. Um, and it's, you know, we're in the, in, in the center, in the middle of winter. Um, but COVID tests in general are antigen tests, which um, is, is great and convenient, but not as accurate in picking up all the active cases of COVID as a PCR or molecular test, which is what the hospital, hospitals and clinics will offer you. So to put it another way, if you are exposed or you're having active symptoms and you test positive on a home test, that's very helpful information. It means you're positive and that you're infectious enough that these tests that you do with the nose swab can pick it up. However, if you're um, definitely exposed or you're having active symptoms and the home test is negative, it doesn't tell us that much. It actually just means that you should contact your primary care doctor to get the better test, which is the PCR molecular test that will pick up with a lot more sensitivity if you're positive. Um, now you can go to usps.com and get per household, you can get four free um, home test kits um, to be delivered to your home. So I'd encourage you to go to, to this website. You can just Google or type in USPS free COVID tests and you will be um, mailed this sometime starting in late January. Um, in order to look for other commercial tests out there, um, there is a Massachusetts website where you can go put in your zip code and they'll find tests that are available for you as well. Um, and, and, and sorry, this, this one would be to get a full PCR test. So if the commercial ones aren't doing the trick, if, if it's negative but you're still suspicious, this would be the place to go to find a full PCR molecular test, or please be in contact with your primary care clinic to get that more, more exact test done. Um, lastly, the Biden administration just came up with some guidance um, just a few days ago saying that they're trying to get more home tests covered um, through your health insurance. So when you're purchasing home tests, 
it might not be a bad idea to ask if your health insurance could be applied for the cost. To move on quickly, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about what if you do um, get a positive test, which is happening more frequently these days. Um, thankfully, again, if you're fully vaccinated, we're, we have optimism that you'll, you'll do very well. However, there are these monoclonal antibodies um, as treatments. Only one of the previous few that we had around is really um, effective for um, the Omicron variant that we're seeing now. It's called sotrovimab. And it's pretty much the one we're really focusing on right now. The important things to note about this infusion, which takes a 30 minute, 30 minute one time infusion, is that you need to get it within a 10 day window of first having symptoms. So that this is why it's so important to test. And if you're testing at home and you're negative, but you still feel like something's not right, that's why it's so important to get the more exact test, your primary care provider or one of these public avenues. Um, that we, as a hospital, we only get a small allotment compared to the number of, need, uh, of needed uh, patients, a small allotment of these infusions. Um, and so we're referring the appropriate people to get our own infusions, but if not, we're also helping you connect to public um, other sources of getting these infusions. We do think these infusions um, do reduce hospitalizations and deaths overall um, for people who get these. These infusions are only approved for people in the outpatient setting, so they're not approved to be used for people who are currently hospitalized with COVID or have a new oxygen need because of COVID. And um, lastly, I just wanted to zoom out even a little bit more and talk about your medical care in general during this stressful time of COVID. Um, we know it's scary to be in the hospital to get your routine care, but another um, reminder that your, your doctors are, and, and your uh, team members are still available for you during this time because um, we're not exactly sure how, how long this will last. Currently in Massachusetts, um, we have special permission to see you virtually, even if you're across state lines for about the next two weeks. So um, I know some of you um, tra travel and spend some of the um, winter months um, outside of Massachusetts. If that's the case, but you still have a medical need, please don't be shy in reaching out to us. This won't last forever, but it is a temporary um, thing we can do. Um, also per state guidance, most of our elective procedures and, and surgeries are still on hold. So be on the lookout for when, when that will start to get rescheduled. Third, I just wanna mention that um, we have um, updated visitor policies. So for all inpatients, it's one visitor per day. And for outpatient visits, it's also one um, person who can accompany you. However, if you are um, a support person for someone with say significant cognitive impairment or uh, trouble with mobility, that's a whole different category. So just a reminder to advocate for yourself and your, for your loved ones. Um, if, if, if that doesn't strictly meet the one person per patient um, criteria. Lastly, just want to give a quick plug that this weird time, this stressful time where there's many kind of abstract possibilities and fears, um, and yet we're, we're hoping that things are getting better. This might be the perfect time to kind of look at um, your care from a, a, a big um, lens kind of sense and think about, do I have what we call a healthcare proxy, which is if in an emergency situation, you couldn't speak for yourself, do you have a trusted family member who knows your values and your priorities as a person and could speak on your behalf? And does your primary care doctor know that this person is the designated person um, you want to speak for you? And also thinking about things like if you have strong, um, you know, uh, if you've had strong thoughts or discussions regarding um, things like code status or kind of um, wishes for emergency situations, this would be a good time to sit down with your primary care doctor and make sure they're aware of these kind of just in case scenarios as well. So I know I've spoken a lot. I will um, stop here and maybe we can transition to more Q&A. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, Dr. Marino, I'm gonna come back to you with a question. Um, we have someone who, who asks, could you give us the bottom line? And so my version of that question is, can you say a little bit more about the foods that, are really helpful 
that you had, that when you had those two boxes about the survey that you did, you had fruits and vegetables. And then in the other box, you had like fast food, you know, lots of sweets, that sort of thing. Can you just say a little bit more about that balance of what's in that positive box versus what's in the negative box that people should, you know, not completely eliminate, because I think that's hard for all of us, but that you want to have more of one and less of the other. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Thanks for thanks for these questions. Yeah, I think that the bottom line of our study is that a place-based diet is associated with lower risk and severity of COVID. This is likely more relevant among people living in more the private areas or people suffering from metabolic conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or certain forms of cancer, and that our results are sensitive, our results hold after several sensitive analyses, which is reassuring, but also meaning that means that it needs validation in independent studies. So that's the bottom line of our study. So then in terms of the healthy plan based uh, diet index, what we have in these two different boxes are components that give you higher score in this index if you eat them a lot and components that give you a higher score in this index if you eat them a few. So for the green ones, the ones that give you higher score if you eat, if you eat them a lot, we have uh, fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole, uh, whole cereals, so things that they have a lot of fiber and fiber it's the component that includes a lot of vitamin, minerals, and things that might be related to beth, better immunity and health and, 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 and immunity function and, and health status. On the other side, in the red one, we have things like red meat, processed meat, eggs, dairy, things that if you eat a lot of them, they give you a, a lower score in this index and things that have been related with the development of co complex chronic diseases like obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So these components, differently to the ones that are in the green uh, box, they like fiber and they like all these uh, things that we call micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, things like that. Okay. So yeah, did I answer so your question? I think so. I'm also going to ask Dr. Levine um, and Dr. Lee if you, I mean, I know you probably get asked questions about diet and nutrition a lot. If you want to add anything to that in terms of the, the types of food. I mean, one of the recommendations that I've often had is try not to eat anything that's got something you can't pronounce in it, um, you know, on the bag. Um, and that's been a good rule of thumb for me because that often keeps you away from a lot of highly processed foods. Um, but I'm just going to give Dr. Levine or Dr. Lee a chance to, if you want to maybe add anything to what Dr. Marino just shared. You're on mute, Dr. Levine. Deb, do you want to take a stab at it or do you want me to? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think um, it's really what you already said. I mean, when you think about fruits and vegetables and leafy things and grains and this is how i interpret what's in that that box um things that are not processed like processed cold cuts and ham or um you know red meats uh, uh or you know tons of white bread that doesn't have any kind of um green you know whole grain in it it sounds like from you know the big overview of this picture is what we would normally call a healthy diet. So we're, we're I mean, I think, I don't know where fish fits into this, but um, <laughs> where fish fits into this diet, but sort of what we call a Mediterranean diet, maybe, or what we call a vegetarian or um, that that kind of diet where we, we don't, where it's not meat heavy. That's not where it's focused. It's really focused on less calorie dense foods that have lots of roughage and things like that. Am I right, Jordy, that those are the kinds of things that you're talking about? That's how I interpret that to, to try and put it into the real, like, what would you eat for, for dinner? Would you have a, you know, would you have rice with, um, with grains or, or 
vegetables mixed with it? Would you have a, you know, I don't, th I think you can eat, you know, you can have cheeses with that because remember, if you're someone, especially for women, but men also, you want to make sure that you have calcium for your bones and um, vitamin D that you're taking and you don't want to only eat fruits and vegetables. We need, we need things that are good for all of our body. I think what Dr. What Dr. Marino's study shows is it's how much you weigh each of these things in your diet, and um, and the kind of um, health that you have, and the the kind of diet you have. It appears in 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 the grand scheme of this very large study to car you know correlate with less illness related to COVID, and um, and that's worth knowing. Is that clear? Do you think, Susan? I think it is, and you know, just another thing that I've learned over the years is that because I noticed on the in the red box you had fruit juices and one of the things I've learned is that if if you have a choice between drinking a glass of orange juice or having an orange you get much more fiber with the orange than you do with the orange juice which has a lot of sugar so when you're balancing eating a piece of fresh fruit fruit versus really processed fruit, I think you always wanna to go to the less processed things. Um, so, you know, one other thing I'll share that I've always thought was fascinating is that if you come in for your annual wellness visit, you get asked about what you're eating. And one of the things that has been looked at in the context of collecting a lot of the information from the nutrition survey that's part of the annual wellness visit that I think is really fascinating is one of the strongest predictors of someone's overall long-term well-being was whether they ate peanut butter or not. And I'm like, peanut butter? And the answer I got is that peanut butter actually has a lot of protein. And for a lot of older people that don't necessarily have access to getting to the grocery store or you know, affording a lot of expensive food, peanut butter is a very good source of protein. I hope Dr. Marino doesn't um, get upset with me for talking about peanut butter, but um, I do think that's something else just to think about having in your diet because it's easy, it's easy to get, and it's good for you. Yeah, this is not so. counting all of the, um, you know, all of the people have underlying conditions where some foods are, you know, if, if you know, if you have diverticulitis, you don't want to eat a lot of little seeds or, or things like that. So this all is in the, this is a very high level presentation, but there are some people because of um, issues with their gut or their bowels or other things that, can't eat certain kinds of foods. And that's when it's really important to talk to your doctor and say yeah. what, what's good for me to eat and what's not appropriate for me to eat. Other, other, oh, someone, oh, um, can you say a little bit about the proteins? Um, and this may be again too, too specific, but the proteins that are healthy. I mean, um, Sharon asked about fish or, you know, I don't think we're going to go toward red meat. Anyway. Yeah, I think I think that the question needs to reformulate it because protein is not healthy or unhealthy. It's the food that contains this protein that may be more or less healthy. So, and I think that you already answered that question. If you eat protein in a food that contains a lot of saturated fats, nitrates, cholesterol, sodium, it might become less healthy than if you eat a protein that is in a food that does not contain all these things. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's, that distinction is important. We are not eating nutrients, we are eating foods and the matrix of the food, it's very, very important on the health effect of this food. And I think that also it's what, what Sharon mentioned before, it's really important, the dynamic changes through the life on the nutritional requirements and how someone adapt their diet through the life to get the maximum benefit. And this is something that we are currently investigating to see whether people at certain ages are more likely to benefit from a specific dietary, different dietary compositions than others. And, and yeah, I think that that's very relevant. And, I, and I'm sure that this might have played a role in the risk and development of COVID, but it's not a study at all. 
So we have uh, we have two other questions. One um, may be more what we would address if we have one of our lifestyle medicine physicians or a nutritionist join us in the future. But are, um, can you say anything about the importance of vitamin D and, and supplements or anything else that you looked at in the study? And then also people want to know if the study is still ongoing and if you can enroll. So B vitamin D, I think it's the most conflicting nutrient in the COVID uh, uh, bibliography. I mean, there were several reports at the very beginning showing that the supplementation with vitamin D was associated with lower risk of COVID. Then there were short, small clinical trials showing no beneficial effect of vitamin D supplementation on COVID. And what people are suggesting is that in the form of supplements, vitamin D might not work. And if you eat the vitamin D in the real food, then you might take the full advantage of eating enough vitamin D. So, so, so a critical question on the role of vitamin D in immunity is whether this vitamin D came from supplements with nothing else, or whether this vitamin D came in a form of a rich diet that contains all other nutrients that are necessary. I think that what is relevant in nutrition research is that it's very, very difficult to attribute the health effect of a single nutrient and a single component because everything gets merged in a huge matrix of a lot of nutrients, a lot of foods. So for these reasons in our study, we never studied a single component rather than an overall dietary pattern that might provide a better indication of, this, of how all these foods and components interact in each other and provide some additional health benefits. So that's, that's, that's my, my knowledge. The, 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 the role of vitamin D in immunity, it's not clear. Some positive results, some null results. And then related to a second question, if you are still able to participate in a study, yes, the, the, the mobile phone application is free to download uh, for iPhones and for uh, other uh, cell phone devices. So yeah, if you type COVID-19 study in Google, mobile phone application, you, you, you will find it. And then you will be able to provide uh, information about your characteristics. And then you will receive daily remind, reminders to, upload, to update the symptoms or whether you had received any vaccination or whether you need to go to the hospital, things like that. And this really, really, really helps to monitor the pandemic. So especially during the first days of the pandemic where we didn't have any official data, we didn't know the status of the situation. So this kind of citizen science efforts really, really help to better understand the pandemic, identify hotspots, identify waves and things like that. So now we are taking advantage of this infrastructure to better understand the effect of variants like Omicron, the potential effect of vaccination on long COVID. So we are, uh, so we are, we are a team of 20, 30 scientists actively working in all these questions. So as much data as available to us, we could do better predictions and conduct better studies. It would be very interesting to see in the countries that are mostly eating plant-based foods, um, whether, you know, whether there is less incidence, where, where they're eating more plant-based foods that where there's less inf incidence of COVID when you look at it geographically. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's very relevant. And, and, and yeah, I mean, the, the natural experiment is Africa. Africa, it's not suffering from these huge waves of uh, COVID. And this is, this compared to Western countries, it's, it's much, much lower. Uh, so, so, yeah, I'm sure that this is quite relevant as well. You know, I've participated in this study since I think it was first rolled out. And I have to say, it made me feel like I was doing something helpful. Um, and every, you know, I feel like I get a little reminder every day to check in and say what's going on with me. And so one thing I would ask Dr. Marino is maybe if you could type in the chat how the, the information, you had it in your slide deck, but if you could type it into the chat so that if people want to enroll, if they're not already participating, they can. And I am gonna say to um, Dr. Russell, I totally agree. It's a lot more fun to think about eating healthy, good food than taking a lot of pills. And I think just to drive home that that fact that it's it's the matrix of how that nutrition and nutrient is contained. You know, we, we've had 5 billion years 
to get the foods that we're supposed to eat right. And only in the past hundred years have we started to fiddle with it and it doesn't seem to be going well. So, so I think if we can just, you know, eat that healthy diet, um, you know, we don't have to take a, uh, a meal full of, of supplements and pills that in a lot of ways just make us financially poorer, but also gustatorially have absolutely no, no pleasure. And it's a real pain to keep track of them. Mm -hmm. So, and just wanted to add that in general, if you have healthy kidneys, um, we say supplements are shouldn't be too harmful because if you get an extra something through a vitamin or a pill, you should pee out what your body doesn't need. So we say it's a way to really make expensive urine. However, if you have bad, bad kidneys or compromised kidneys, it's not a smart idea to take too much supplements. And then specifically about vitamin D, there's actually more data saying that if you take high dose vitamin D, um, like on a weekly basis, we used to do that out of convenience, that can actually lead to more fractures paradoxically. So I think everything kind of within reason, um, if you overdo the vitamin D, that could actually hurt your skeletal health. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. I don't see any other questions. So I'm just going to ask Dr. Levine, is Dr. did we lose Dr. Levine? I think she sent she's a message back. that she had, she's back. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, do you want to make it. any closing remarks? I just think that this is a really interesting topic. It makes me think that there are lots of people that who are really interested in learning about what we put in our mouths, whether we're have a, a healthy diet or not, but sort of how we could expand our diet, how we could improve our health through diet, how we can um, treat certain illnesses, which many of us have, things like diabetes and high cholesterol or bowel problems or things like that, and how we can make that work. And, you know, it's not sort of part of what we do all the time. Um, and it makes me think that this would be a wonderful topic to sort of carry forward rather than fixed on I mean, this is one one illness with um, that's a, a a a international illness, and um, countries have different kinds of diets, and yeah. um, and people eat different kinds of things, and can change their diets um, depending upon medical conditions they have. So, it makes me think that there's a lot more here to talk about in the future that would be really interesting to me. I'm certainly no expert in this. Many of you may be better experts about things regarding your own health um, and what you've learned in dealing with health conditions. So I, I think that um, we, we really, we, we could all learn a lot more about this through nutrition and it doesn't get the high billing that it should get probably a lot of the time, but it is a very, very important thing for all, for us all to know about um, uh, in, in in the sort of micro environment and in the large, in the world, um, larger, in the larger world. So um, I'm yeah. sorry, I did get cut off. It's been great to see all of you here. And, um, and uh, we really, um, you know, look forward to seeing you in on future town halls. And if you have ideas for topics you want to talk about, you can let us know. Um, and we would love to know about it. You can, um, I don't know, Susan, what's the best way if people have topics that they're interested in for them to, to let us know? I think they can send them in to Monique. They can put them here in the chat. And one other just quick thing I want to mention is that over the past um, many, many months that we've been doing the town halls, I, I recognize and know some of you that have been on many of these um, in our meetings. And we've had Dr. Helen Delacatios, who is one of our lifestyle medicine physicians, who's also had training in um, sort of healthy culinary cooking at the Culinary Institute of America. And she's been on teaching us some very simple recipes. I think her favorite was chocolate covered strawberries. Um, but I think that we can think about maybe having her and some of her colleagues that really have expertise in this to join us in the future, which could be really fun. Eat lunch before you come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A salad. Um, <laughs> Sounds good, but only salad is not so good. That would not be right. a great diet to only eat salad, <laughs> especially carrots. Your skin will turn orange. 
<laughs> well, it's great to see you all, and we hope to see you back um, for our next town hall. Do we know when will it be? When it will be, Susan? Yet? It's or in Monique? February, but I don't have the date in my head. Judy, you may have the exact date. No, I don't think we have an exact date yet, but we will be sending it out. And thank you so much to our speakers and to Susan for moderating. This was very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Marino and Dr. Lee, and for all the others, Sharon and Matt, and all who put this together. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, have a good thank afternoon. You. Have a, great, have a day. great day and stay healthy.